Hi, everyone, and welcome. This is Inga Hansen, editor of Metastetics Magazine, and we are going to go ahead and get started. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Today we'll be discussing recent news surrounding sunscreen active ingredients, as well as looking at advances in sun protection formulations. Our presenters are Dr. Harry Fallick, a plastic surgeon and founder of Faline, the maker of Tizo sunscreens, and Amanda Beretta, a licensed esthetician and trainer with Tizo. Thank you so much for joining us, Amanda and Dr. Fallick. Thank you. Thank you, Inga. We really appreciate it. And appreciate all you folks joining us, and we hope we'll really be giving you some current events and some old news and some new news. Um, we're doing this today, myself, I'm Harry Fallick. I'm Amanda Beretta. Tell All right, so I am a licensed esthetician. I've been an esthetician for about five years, and I started working with Tizo and learning all about mineral sunscreens, thanks to the great Dr. Harry Fallick. And I have a I driver's license. <laughs> And so, yeah, so I am now the brand educator and on the sales team as well with Tizo. So let's get to the, the information here. And, and it's a, it's, this is not really a short thing because this isn't a short topic. But we wanted, we started this about four months ago mm -hmm. when we said there's some great sunscreen information in the news that we think people are going to be coming to their estheticians, their doctors, and asking questions about chemical sunscreen seeping into the bloodstream and mineral sunscreens being addressed as being safe or as chemical sunscreens need more research and seeping into the bloodstream of chemical research uh, sunscreens. And then the Sunscreen and the Coronavirus CARES Act came, and we'd like to touch on that too. So when we started four or five months ago, we were really addressing the two FDA studies that were performed in, in uh, 2018 and 2019, maybe 2020. But then there's even some more information that I think impacts everybody that came out in the 800 page CARES Act. So we're gonna touch on that a little bit too. So these are some of the sunscreen headlines that we've seen. A lot of them, to just a consumer can be pretty scary. I mean, when you see a headline that says sunscreen chemicals seep into your bloodstream after one day of use, you wanna know more about that. Um, so as, as Harry was saying, they're probably gonna to come to the professional and ask some questions. So we're just here to clear a little bit of stuff up and make it easier for you to understand and also to explain it. So I think that's really true. I think there's nothing that we're gonna say that you can't find somewhere else, hopefully, and nothing that we've invented ourselves. We've tried to, coalesce a bunch of data, the two sunscreen studies, uh, some of the stuff out of the CARES Act, but I always find this interesting because this goes back to the 70s. A lot of people, and I, and I don't think anybody on, on our attendee list, but a lot of people don't realize that sunscreens are drugs. They're over-the-counter drugs, but they have to be validated, they have to be assayed, they, they certainly have a structure, function, effect, but one thing that never happened was that they were never really studied in terms of their effect, their absorption, because these came out in the 70s and that's when people were maybe using an SPF 4 or using it occasionally or wanting to get a tan. So over the last 30, 40 years, there's been so much evolution of sunscreens, not only into makeups and into moisturizers and into hair care products and wash off products, you know, which the FDA has addressed. But just the general use in makeup and daily products and SPFs of 100. And so we tried to list here a little regulatory history. We took out about 10 things. We drunk from 78 to 2014. Not that there isn't a lot in there, but this is when we thought stuff started getting interesting, when you had the sunscreen innovation, mm -hmm. which I, I honestly, you know, can't really get into because I'm no regulatory person. But that's kind of significant that both houses of the Congress and Senate ag agreed for, on it. Uh, then we did the 19 proposed sunscreen rules, the 2019 OTC monograph report, and most significantly, in my mind, is the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Act to go to recovery. Um, and I think 
don't you agree, Amanda? This uh, this 2019 was dramatic. That was huge, and that's when it pretty much came into the news, and that's when all the questions happened. I just want to make sure you can hear us all, but there's no problem. So we're just yep. making sure that we're talking loud enough. But uh, along with what Amanda's saying, the 2019, I wanted to address the 2020 Coronavirus Act because I can't address it. And here's an example. So this was an 880 page act. You know, we all know about it, I would imagine. And, and this is just like the first paragraph. And Nadine Schaff is a great student of sunscreens, more than a student, a great teacher of sunscreens, I gave an example of this. And I tried reading the 70 pages. It starts like on 416 or 417 to 506. I, I can't get through it. So I can read it, but I can't understand it. And here's an example why. Um, it's very complicated and I think it's, very complicated on purpose, but I, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just a complicated we'll thing. To it. Yeah, we'll we'll get back to more of that. Yep. Go ahead, ma'am. All right. So first thing, we're just going to start with the basics, and that's understanding the different filters and their mode of action. So there are two different sunscreen filters that you can have and use, and the first one is the physical reflector, inorganic, and the organic chemical absorber. So the difference is the filters that you can have to be a physical reflector, there's only two of them, and that's zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Whereas with chemical absorbers, there are not two, there's multiple, and there's a list of some. There's octane, um, octosalate, octocrylene, avobenzone. So the difference between the two is a physical filter sunscreen reflector works like a shield. It actually will scatter and reflect harmful UVA radiation away from your skin. So picture it like little tiny mirrors when you put a physical sunblock on, little mirrors just reflecting the UV radiation, whereas chemical is actually absorbing. So it absorbs the UV rays through a chemical reaction and it changes that into heat. So if you've ever been to the beach and put on the sunscreen and actually felt like your skin was on fire, it was just a result from the sun's UV rays turning into heat. So Can I, I just want to jump please. in. We specifically wanted to call these inorganic mm -hmm. because they're rocks and then organic because there's a lot of confusion about that. And we like to realize that these are coming from the organic chemical lab, not the organic farmer. Whereas the inorganic are rock, the organic, which are also called chemical, but of course everything's chemical. We just wanted to say these are the man-made synthetic um, and these are based around the physical properties of zinc and titanium. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's really great that you said that because a lot of people think of organic and they want organic everything, especially when it comes to skincare. And it's a little bit different. So it's nice to understand the difference. So just some more differences for mineral filters. They are category one grade, which is generally regarded as safe and effective. They reflect UVA, UVB rays, lay on top of the skin. Um, very, there's very, very little irritation around your eyes, great for sensitive skin. And then they have the chemical filters. So they are category three. They absorb UVA and UVB radiation. They absorb into the bloodstream. They can be irritating to your eyes. There's a lot of allergic reactions to them. And there have been studies, which we'll get to that so this was what we thought most people were seeing in the news going into 2020, that in 19, even in, you know, throughout the time, we've been seeing these headlines of the oxybenzone, the, the Hawaii issues, the Key West issues, you know, some of the other locations where people are talking about the absorption, not only into the bloodstream and into, you know, being excreted in urine, in breast milk, but also how it affects the environment. Um, but the key thing here is that there are two types of OTC sunscreen filters. A lot of the headlines talked about absorption. They never talked about the significance of the non-absorbing mineral filters that are proven to stay on top of your skin and not absorb into your skin. And the key here that we want to say is that 
there are actually three categories. This category one generally recognized as safe and effective. That's titanium and zinc. No further studies. Category two was, and there are two of them in there, these two sunscreen filters should not be used anymore. We'll talk about that a little later. And those are gone. That's PAPA and the other one that I forget and can't pronounce. Yeah. Manolita. Oh. No. Uh, the category three are currently, currently, although that's even questionable, currently recognizes category three. They have to be studied with the, the maximum use studies that are done. But as we'll learn later, these may be pushed back into category one because of the Coronavirus CARES Act. And that's why we put them here. In February, 2019, they were considered category three for further studies. They may get pushed back into category one. So anyway. All right, so this was actually a really cool thing that we did. So it just doesn't look cool here, though. I think it looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> we do have videos on this as well, and um, we have it up on our YouTube page if you want to look more into the video. So what we did is we took a Canon camera, a really nice camera. We had it sent out, and we had the lenses taken out to filter UV light. So basically, when you take a photo or a video with this camera, what it shows you is how the sun is seeing you. So the top picture, she has a bare face. There's nothing on her skin, freshly washed, sitting in front of this camera. What we did is we put chemical sunscreen on one side and mineral sunscreen on the other to see what it looks like in the camera. Now, chemical sunscreen filters are gonna show up black and black is the color of absorption. So if you think about a black top outside when it's a hot day, that's always the hottest place to step because it's absorbing the heat. So when she put that on her face immediately, this is the reaction that we got. It and shows up. That's black. right. You can see it right in that one on, I guess it would be the left one, the one where it's black on her face. And labeled chemical sunscreen. And labeled chemical. <laughs> How did they think of that? Right. So then we said, here, try the mineral sunscreens. Different hand, different side of your face. And as you can see, you can't tell that there's anything there because the mineral filters are actually reflecting what the sun. It, they're reflecting the, the UVA and UVB radiation. So as the sun sees it, the chemical shows up as black. The mineral shows up not. Silver. Yeah. It almost reflects it. And if any of you folks have been to either the American Academy of Dermatology, IECSC, a lot of shows, we have this great big video wall of this exact thing because what we're trying to show is how different the chemical is from the mineral. Not only is it turning your face black, but you're able to pull a blood level on the chemical sunscreen. The mineral shows up as silver, never, never absorbs, and just reflects. So this is, although we didn't want to put a full video here, these are some snapshots of it. And as Amanda mm -hmm. said, the video. Yeah, right like there. I said, if you wanted to watch the whole video, it's actually really cool to watch because you can see their genuine reactions. I mean, these are pictures. They're still shots from the videos. But you can see how fast you can tell that it's absorbing through the camera. It's, it's the visualization of this ultraviolet thing. And just to clarify, we send these cameras off, they remove the filters that are filtering ultraviolet light. So now they're letting ultraviolet light into the camera. And you probably saw those commercials, Walgreens had a whole series yeah. of them. You see the, the, the visualization of the skin damage. Here we're seeing the visualization of light either being absorbed with the chemical or being reflected with the mineral. Yep. Onward. So right. now, now we get to the meat, now meat. So basically, FDA, and I think this was really wise, said these sunscreens have been around for a long time. People started using them in the 70s. Nobody thought we were going to use them this much. Let's go back and see what's really going on. So this first FDA study was conducted on 24 volunteers. And if you see the green there, that's kind of the whole description. It was The product was put on four times a day for four days. Because you you know the most important thing is reapplying your sunscreen, not just doing it. Here they chose four different types of products, two different sprays, a lotion and a cream. They had avabenzone, oxybenzone, octocrylene, or L'Oreal's patented in capsule that did do an NDA. And what they basically demonstrated here was absorption using four commercially available sunscreen products. And they pulled blood levels. Now, they, they expected that there would be nothing higher than 0.5 nanoliters. And nanograms things, I'm sorry, nanograms per milliliter. Oxybenzone, 209. 
and spray one, 194, 169. So this was the first study that was done under maximum use conditions, getting the plasma concentrations. And of course, they needed a second study. This was the first study that alerted people that there was really true absorption, excretion through the body of chemical sunscreens. But to prove it, they did the second study. And if you go to the next slide, we, we summarized that, next, that first study um, into this. Now, one of the things that was pretty significant was that the tagline, which did not indicate that individuals should refrain from the use of sunscreens. And I think that is very important because I just read a study that says only 11% of people use sunscreens. But again, all active ingredients in the study were absorbed in the levels higher than 0.5 nanograms per milliliter. And oxybenzone was particularly uh, significant because it, hit, it exceeded the threshold in two hours. So that was the summary. Um, then they did another study, and this study was done in January, February. It got published, let me think, I think it got published in, and it's on the bottom there, in 2018. Again, a lotion, a spray, a non-aerosol spray compared to the aerosol spray, and a pump spray. Here, uh, six actives. Now, not all of the actives were in all of the different uh, products. So if you see the dash here, that's because that active wasn't in it. But you'll get these, these uh, results, you'll get, you know, you'll be able to print them. And if you just look at this, it's like, wow, it's crazy. There's some significant absorption here. 48 volunteers, 24 men, 24 women, um, four times a day again to 75% of their body collected for 21 days. And some of the ingredients were around 21 days. Yeah. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, in this study they did, so they, they added more people and they added yes. more time. So they collected blood samples throughout the study and then up to 21 days, even though the this, this study wasn't that long. And here again are the results. Um, all six of the tested active ingredients in four different sunscreen formulations. I, I bet a lot of other people can read. I don't need to do this. But again, they do not indicate that individuals should refrain from the use of sunscreen. That was kind of something that mm -hmm. they were sort of told to put on there because there was a fear factor involved here. And certainly people should not refrain from the use of sunscreens, but they should be cognizant of what activities they well, want to use. They're using. And whether or not they want to spray mm -hmm. it, inhale it, urinate it, lactate okay. it. That's right. Well, the interesting thing that I think on this slide is the third bullet point where the levels remained greater than what the FDA's threshold is in, in you know, over half of the, the participants. And then for 10 days afterwards and 20 days, 21 days after that, they were still finding traces of oxybenzone and homozelly in, in their blood when they haven't been using it for a couple of weeks. So that I think is the crazy part. So then we go back to, well, what about mineral sunscreen? So titanium dioxide and zinc oxide, they were not included in either FDA study because they are great. They are generally regarded as safe and effective. So like I said before, those are the two minerals that can be used in a mineral sunscreen. Um, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, they're largely insoluble in water. Um, so they preclude system, uh, systemic absorption. Now we go to the fun stuff. Okay, so <laughs> this really isn't fun, but this is in the news and we wanted, you know, again, originally we were just doing this to talk about absorption and what the right kind of sunscreen, particularly for kids and immunocompromised people and people that use a lot of it because of either chemo, transplants, skin cancer, aging. But then this came out and this was the 2020 Coronavirus Aid Relief Economic Security Act. I have to tell you, um, I went to a few sources. I, I actually found a few different sources. Chemical Week had some good stuff on it. Nadeem Shaft's article just in uh, May's issue of Happy Magazine. I always refer back to Nadeem. He's written two books on sunscreens. I study them. He's an incredible man. And I pulled a bunch of stuff from Happy Magazine. So thank you, Nadeem, if you're here. Um, again, these are some of the things that were in those uh, page 416 to 506. And to summarize, basically, as we can read, the drugs that were deemed safe and effective, category one, will stay in category one. 
the drugs that were in category three in the under the um, advanced notice of proposed rulemaking essentially go back into the grass, if I understand this correctly, go back into the generally recognized as safe and effective. In essence, everything gets pushed back to 1999 from what I've read. So any of the studies, with the exception of those category two products, so category one stays category one, it appears category three may become category one. I don't know, this is very confusing for me too, and I've got to understand it better. But these were some of the things that came out of the Coronavirus Relief Act, which was amazing. So you have that, then you have the ones in category two that are gonna be gone. Um, the most significant thing to me was the ingredients that were originally coming in on the time and extent applications through FDA, the new filters. I'm not really sure. I can just let you read what I got pulled out of I'm not really sure how to interpret it because I'll go back to the other slide that's that's I can't even interpret that paragraph so I will say that there's a question about some of the new drugs and I'm sure some of the folks here will be able to address that better I just wanted you to know that this 2020 coronavirus act that everybody got twelve hundred dollars and people got the checks for the payroll protection plan was also talking about not just sunscreens but OTC products in general. And it seems like it is gonna sunset the Sunscreen Innovation Act of 2014, that by 2022, it will be disappearing. So again, I apologize. I can interpret, and Amanda and I interpret the absorption of different things. It's a lot of information. When it comes to the Sunscreen Act, I mean, the Coronavirus Act, we wanted to to bring all this stuff up i'm sure in those pages there's going to be more and please we're not trying to say that we think this is complete but we didn't want to miss the fact we don't want to leave it out yeah that that it almost causes more confusion in my mind than just mm -hmm. here's category one here's category three you know how what products do you want to use because it seems like things are going backwards in this one but I'm not sure. Time will tell. Time will tell, Amanda. Yep. I may not have the time, but you're young. You'll have the time. <laughs> I'll let you know. Okay, please call me when I'm <laughs> done. <laughs> so what does all this mean? What does all this mean? All this means is wearing sunscreen is still critical. And like you said, reading these headlines, people come up with the conclusion themselves that, well, sunscreen's bad for you. But no, you just need to understand the difference. And the studies that the FDA did, they tell us what, you know, the chemicals get absorbed in the bloodstream and how much and what threshold, but they don't tell you what it actually does to our mind. So there's no further studies that way. So they need to do more research. I mean, we know it passes through placenta and, and breast milk and all of that, but we need more research done on how it actually affects those children when they're in the womb and when they're children wearing sunscreen. But wait, what happens if there's more? <laughs> What happens if I don't want to wait for that research or if that research doesn't get published well, like the, the good news currency. for you because mineral sunscreens have already been considered safe and effective. So you just have to make sure you're looking for a mineral sunscreen, which means that it has to have zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. So we have to be informed, intelligent consumers of what we put on our body. Yes. Because truly all this goes back to 1939, I believe. The, the law enacted to say cosmetics, prescription drugs, what absorbs, what doesn't absorb. And the science, just like automotive technology, is not 1939 anymore. No. You know, there's no Teslas in 1939. In 1939. And titanium and zinc are such incredible entities, such incredible moieties, and are so effective at so many things that we don't, I don't know if we need to know about the studies on kids. We know that the chemicals are already there. We want our kids to use the right things. We don't want to have to study on them. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but I everything you put on your skin is going to, you know, do something for you. So here's the thing. If I know something's getting absorbed into my bloodstream and it's chemicals that shouldn't be there, I'm just going to stay away from them. Like you were saying, I'm not going to wait for any more research. Personally, I don't want that on my body. 
So we have some tips for choosing a mineral sunscreen because not all sunscreens are made equal. And, you know, something that might be great for me and my favorite product might not be great for you because everybody has a different skin type. They're all looking for something different. So the first thing, the most important thing that you want to do is check the active ingredients. Now, and I have to tell you, that's yeah. the key because I see a lot of products that highlight zinc mm -hmm. and then I turn it and around, turn and, it around. Back, and there's chemical sunscreen. Yes. So if you're going to do it right, you don't want those other, you just want zinc and titanium mm -hmm. or and just zinc Burn it titanium. around because right. like you were saying, Harry, there's a lot of products out there that say zinc oxide sunscreen, yeah. but then you turn it around and it has three other chemicals in it. So that's not a mineral sunscreen. So check the active ingredients, turn it around, see what it highlights. Um, another thing is consider the use. What are you going to be doing? Are you going to be running around all day? Are you just looking for something to throw on in the morning and keep on all day while you're in the office? It, you know, you need to look for water resistant. Try it out. Um, try it on. Not everything, like I said, is created equal. So you want to make sure that the, the texture is right for you and see if it leaves a smell or not. Um, you know, something that's not sticky, something that doesn't come up white because zinc oxide when you have a lot of it i mean and a large particle size i yeah. mean think about like classic cartoons or classic shows when they have or movies and the life bar has the big you know the white nose with the zinc oxide mineral sunscreen not everything is going to leave you like that um specifically with ties though we use iron oxide to tint our products and it doesn't give you like a full coverage foundation it's not a makeup it just takes away from that white zinc cast that you might have but you know what, no matter what, mm -hmm. compliance. If you like it, you'll use it. Exactly. We sell a lot of product in Asia, and those countries don't want a tint. They want non-tinted Yep, products. I mean, it's all preference. Like I said, what works for you might not work for somebody else. Um, and then which form? There's so many different forms of sunscreen, it's crazy. So, you know, you can get a little mini stick, a chapstick, there's sprays. Now, we don't like sprays. Something about sprays, we stay away from sprays and we actually do foam. So they come out like a mousse and they spread on like a lotion. The reason we don't like sprays is how many times have you been on the beach and somebody 10 feet away from you is spraying on their sunscreen and you end up inhaling it. So nobody wants to inhale sunscreen, first of all. And you know, the wind blows and you're spraying it on and you have uneven distribution. So what's the point? I don't know. What's the point? I don't think there is a point. No good point. <laughs> well, then what happens is then you have streaks all over your body. Well, the bigger thing is really the inhalation of the air. Yeah. Oh, that's definitely huge. Yeah. So check out which form, try it on, consider what you're using it for, and check the active ingredients by actually turning it around and looking at the drug facts. But you know, the opposite's true too. A lot of people, well, I don't know a lot of people, but it must be a lot of people are using a moisturizer or makeup. And they say, well, it has it, it in has there. It in there. But yeah. try to determine which form you want and focus on that and see if you can find it. And if you can't, that's okay. Use a separate sunscreen and a different mm -hmm. makeup. You know, the sunscreen is, I believe, the most important part of your daily skin regime because sun is what ages you. Mm -hmm. So you're stopping the aging and, and prevention. But you have to get the right type. This absorption of the chemical sunscreen has never been our our mode of action as the first line. Yeah. We prefer physical. Okay. So just a little bit a of little plug. Yeah, a little, a little plug, plug for us. So we are Taizo and Harry, when did you start this company? Uh when I started. So we started <laughs> actually in 1989 and Taizo stands for titanium iron oxide. We started in 89. We started making sunscreens really by 91, 92. It took a while. Um, but we really have gone to 100% free of chemical sunscreens, preservative, fragrance, parabens. We try to make a clean product in the drug world. Basically, everything about sunscreen that people don't love, smell, sticky, greasy, stuff like that, we don't have any of that. We don't put fragrances, we don't put the oils, we don't put the chemical sunscreen filters. Um, and, and I mean, you guys have been perfecting this for years. I think the product is amazing. It speaks for itself. It's just a very soft, elegant mineral sunscreen. And there's a lot of different forms and finishes that we have it in. And, and really, no matter what product you're using, and I think we see this more now, you want to try to go for safety. Yes. 
you know? Absolutely. It's, it's gotta really be first. Which is why it's important for everyone to understand absorption, absorption and reflection. And, yep. and so take a look at these FDA studies and decide, you know, is it worth it to use a sunscreen when they're still working on, you know, doing more studies to get some more research when you can just go to the store and get a mineral sunscreen that is already safe and effective. Or the esthetician. Or the esthetician. Since you're an esthetician. Exactly. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> with professional products, you always want to ask your professional yes. anyway. Um, because they are going to know what's best for the client. I mean, you guys as professionals understand that there's different skin types and, and everybody needs something different. And that's why it's important to know the professional to ask these questions. But to have the knowledge yes. behind it and to be able to teach that to your clients is definitely important. That is definitely that knowledge is has been so knowledge great for is all power. Of us. Yes. Absolutely. So all right, great. Anything else that you want to add, Harry? Um, well, I really think that understanding the absorption two studies. The differentiation of the category one, category three, and then understanding that a lot of this information may disappear over time. If everything gets pushed back to 1999, um, then you're going to have to learn it yourself. Yeah. And that's why this was such an interesting topic, I think. Mm -hmm. I hope that we solved and answered your questions, folks. Um, do we, is there any, well? Yeah. So we can open it up for some questions. So yeah, Inga we... has some questions, I think, previously that, that were yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is Inga again, and thank you guys so much for the presentation. And we do have a number of questions that have come in. And one question had to do with powder SPF products, because those are often physical sunscreen. How effective are those? Well, that's a that's a pretty important question. We thought back in 2011 that they were going to be off the market in terms of SPF. Um, we prefer, and I think most people knowledgeable about the skin barrier, we prefer a lotion or somehow have some type of emulsion that's going to be in the skin. Powders are a funny thing because sunscreen's testing, sunscreen testing is done on the weight of the product. Again, you would probably never have that much lotion on to, to equal the SPF, but when it comes to powder, I feel like you could move the decimal point. Um, I, I think we have to defer that question to the FDA. They did take off uh, towelettes and a few other things. I know there was a question about powder. I, I don't think it should be a primary product. You know, maybe you do a sunscreen and then you Touch up with that. Touch up. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree with that, mainly because I don't see a powder as giving you the full even coverage that you need. Um, it, I mean, it's powder, so it can go anywhere. But um, in truth, that really is up to FDA to but decide. Yeah, I mean, that's just my personal, that's yes. my opinion. So I am the type of person where I would wear a sunscreen and then use that as like a touch up or a reapply type of thing. But yeah, as, as, as a company, Tizo has decided to stay away from that. And is it is an interesting question. Go ahead, Inga. I'm sorry. I was going to say, and I do remember recently when we covered that, the powder was more a question of just not knowing yet. Yes. How and another question we have, when you were talking about the absorption with the chemical filters that they bring sort of heat into the skin, um, would you consider that a, a potential then to exacerbate melasma or other pigmentation problems because of the heat? Well... I mean, I think I think if you just look at absorption in and of itself, that's kind of significant. The time frame, the amount, the levels, you know, they thought anything at 0.5 would be a little bit more than they expected. They came up with 200, 180. I, I think to extrapolate from that to other issues is, is not a good science statement. I am concerned about it in and of itself of the absorption. I think the heat that's generated is also significant in terms of adding to other issues, whether it's melasma, whether it's you know just a reaction to the product. Heat rash, some heat, sort of yeah. reaction. Um, you know, sometimes people, as they get out in the sun early, they'll get small bumps. I forget the name of that disease, but it's a PL polymorphic light eruption. 
you know, the heat may be generating some more instances of polymorphic light eruption, but I think that all needs to be looked at in further studies. I think this was the baseline. There is a deeper interaction than we thought with some of these filters. There's less interaction with others, that being titanium and zinc. Two studies have been done. Now, now maybe somebody will take it upon themselves to study it more and see what are some of the other byproducts of that chemical interaction with the cell, you know, the cell, the body, the entire structure. But that's a great question, Inga, or whoever wrote that. Mm. And we had another question because one topic that has come up, um, but I think over the last decade, has been about vitamin D in people who are really strict with their sun protection. How do you talk to clients and patients who are concerned about vitamin D deficiency and the need to use sunscreen? Well, I'm going to give one opinion and maybe you want to give another, but I'm very lucky. I stopped talking to patients about 18 years ago. I quit the practice of medicine to do this, um, but we do talk about it and it is very significant. And there's two answers. First is it doesn't take that much on a daily basis to get vitamin D production from light exposure. So maybe 15 minutes every day, every other day. However, if you're a high uh, incidence person, maybe you've had an organ transplant or you've had lupus or you have lupus and that causes, you know, to exacerbate your photosensitivity, then you want to use sunscreen even better and you want to use supplements. And there's plenty of vitamin D supplements mm -hmm. that you can do on a consistent basis. So I think, yes, you know, address vitamin D, be aware of it, but don't stop using sunscreen. You know, if, if anything, get, get your 10 or 15 minutes a day of exposure. However, when you get to places like Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, I don't know, our lives are also different because we're inside so much. You know, I think supplementation with vitamin D is good for everybody, as I do believe in vitamin C also. However, when you come to sunscreen, you know, are you really being, are you really reapplying every two hours? Probably not. Are you really using enough? Probably not. So I don't know how much of that has really been charted. Like, how great are we? Again, I just read the study, only 11% of people really use sun protection. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of vitamin D deficiency on everybody. I don't know. Is it that we're just not outside enough? We're not exercising enough? You know. But definitely still wear your sunscreen. Still wear your sunscreen and supplement. Take supplements. Mm -hmm. And in terms of looking at children's formulations for uh, some protection versus adult, are there differences in terms of the percentage that you recommend or that you use in your formulations for a child formulation? Well, you know, of course, as we started, sunscreens are over-the-counter drugs. So they're not prescription. They're not cosmetics. They are drugs. They, you do have to assay and validate the actives and, you know, progress from there. But the FDA monograph sets the parameters. You can't go past, say, 25% zinc, and you can't go lower than whatever the low is. I don't, I don't know. Um, they don't distinguish it from adults to children. And we don't, and really not too many people do in terms of the active. In terms of the excipients or the rest of the formulation, that's some place that you can distinguish it. We, we like our foam for kids because it's easy to apply. At the same time, a lot of people like sprays for kids. We don't because of the inhalation issues and because they're basically always chemical sunscreens. So there's a path that you go down that says these are the actives, this is the formulation. And again, the most important thing is putting it on and reapplying. My favorite to use or to recommend for children um, is we have a product, it is a 20% zinc oxide sunscreen. It's an SPF 40, it's for face and body, it is an ultra zinc sunscreen. And that's personally what I recommend for, um, for children because the 20% zinc oxide makes it great for sensitive skin. And we had a question, there's a, a lot, and it had to do with a, a lot of sunscreen formulations have mineral and chemical. And one of the most common ones you see are like zinc oxide and I'm going to try and pronounce this correctly, oc octanoxate. octanoxate. Yes. Are these go ahead, still considered chemical? And does having that mix reduce that heat absorption you see with a purely chemical sunscreen? Well, 
Hey guys, I said to you, we met each other like 25 years ago. Our first product was a product called Total Block SPF 60. That was titanium and zinc and three chemical sunscreens. As we evolved, and that's why Amanda said, look at the back. We believe once you're a chemical sunscreen, you're a chemical sunscreen. We don't care what else you put in it because that chemical sunscreen is taking its own path. We prefer just straight physical. There are many products because it is hard to formulate and get elegant products with, with minerals of zinc that there are many products that do have chemical filters in it. And I call it doping because you're kind of doping your product. Um, and, and along that line, and you know, one of my suppliers also pointed out, sometimes you get these, these SPF enhancers in the inactive ingredients that are essentially a, a chemical sunscreen that just went into the product as an SPF enhancer. Again, you have to look at the ingredients and not everybody will know the excipients. You certainly don't want it in the actives if you're trying to make a clean product. And certainly the best way is to look at it under our UV camera because that will tell you how it's functioning. And that's how we're making products. We're using the UV camera to decide what's reflecting light the most. What's the brightest coming off of this skin surface? What's the brightest you know, reflection that we can make? So as soon as you put a chemical in your product, you're turning it into a chemical sunscreen, it will go black and it will absorb in the skin. But once again, that's why, you know, when you are looking for a mineral sunscreen, we say, turn it around, don't just read the front. Because like you said, they advertise it as a zinc product or a mineral sunscreen, but when you turn around, they still have the chemicals in there making it a chemical sunscreen. If you want a clean product, if you want a product that you're not gonna urinate out, you can't have a chemical sunscreen. <laughs> that's sorry, that's how I see it. <laughs> And do you need both or, or do your products have both zinc oxide and titanium oxide? And is there a benefit to having a mix or can you use one or the other? So you can use zinc oxide by itself, but you cannot use titanium dioxide alone. I think you can. Titanium? Yeah, you can. Titanium doesn't cover everything. It's titanium not, covers yeah, short UVA. Right. You can get a good UVB product out of titanium. Yes, but you if you want a full out. broad spectrum, you're going to either need zinc. zinc by itself or zinc and titanium together in all of our products we do have a couple products um two two tinted and two non-tinted that are strictly zinc whether it's 20 percent zinc oxide or 16 percent zinc yes. oxide the other products all we use are titanium and zinc but let me just say that being said that's our prejudice to some degree yes maybe we'll find over time that there is just a great titanium particle that mm -hmm. goes further out right now uh, zinc seems to be the best one to get further out UVA and easier to work with. And, you know, we, we love zinc because it's many things. It's an antibacterial, you know, it's, it's something that you have to have as a human to survive orally. Mm -hmm. I guess orally, I guess you can get it. Yeah, like little zinc tablets. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we prefer zinc, but I'm sure there are folks that would argue and say we can do the same with titanium, and maybe they can. We just have not. We're just pushing it. And there was a, a comment about the iron oxides, but does the zinc oxide or titanium also protect against the blue light that people are becoming more concerned about? Well, we have to talk about blue light. We did a lot of work with, with uh, visible light. We like to call it visible light because that's really what it is. And that's really, you know, as we said, sunscreens are drugs. They're OTC drugs and we really address the ultraviolet spectrum. Um, and as far as going into blue light, most of those things are antioxidants. Uh, there's really nothing approved for blue light as a wavelength. It's barely even recognized so much as being harmful by the FDA, not by the medical community. Um, and we prefer to be on this side of the rules, and there are no rules of blue light right now. So it's questionable. There's certainly no filter that's approved for blue light. It seems like it just became like something that everybody's talking about. All of a sudden, about. everybody's talking about it. Whereas in... 1999, I first went to FDA to make a blue light prescription product and they shot me down and I've kind of stayed away from it since then. Although everything changes as we see. Did I answer that question? I don't know. The iron oxide yes. in our products. Oh, iron yeah. oxide is great for blue light. It is so, great, yes. but in our products alone, we use it strictly for the tint so that it does take away from like a white zinc cast. So 
you know, even if there are studies and findings that iron oxide does block blue light, which right now there's nothing that says that, we don't have enough in our product to the, do that, the to best, clean it. The best thing, Inga, and if anyone out there, I'm sure people know about this, is to get a confocal microscope. In our total block 60 product, we shut down to 800 nanometers. I don't see anybody doing any science that really proves that it's treating blue light other than with antioxidants that, I mean, it's not really that wavelength that I can see. But again, that's that's kind of a regulatory question that FDA isn't really addressing it. It seems to be a political or marketing issue that everybody wants to talk about it. And yet there's no real science that says this. Yeah, it's just like, here, this is great. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of stepped back from it. Speaking of antioxidants, there was a question about vitamin C, which has, uh, I believe, been shown to be photoprotective. Is there a benefit, do you feel, to having a sunscreen or sun protection product with added vitamin C? Well, I'll go back to our first product in 92, had CE pycnogenol. So we've always believed in antioxidants. Um, in theory, sometimes it's just to stabilize the product. Sometimes putting antioxidants in the product makes the product last longer. I think as with everything, you know, it's a cumulative effect and we do believe in it and our products do, certain products have any antioxidants. Um, but I think our goal topically is to reflect light and I'm very strong believer in the oral intake of antioxidants and your diet to properly protect yourself and your immune system. So I think it's both things. I think when it comes to sun protection, you can get a good barrier on your skin. When it comes to treating things, you know, that are being addressed there, I think antioxidants are great topically and great orally. Mm -hmm. Can't go wrong. Yeah. Yes, right. And I had a question. I found in those 2018, 2019 studies, part of what was striking is the absorption was very different for a spray versus a lotion versus a cream. Does that in any way translate to efficacy, depending on what kind of I think what they were doing in that study is they were showing how the different types of products, and again, they're not telling you what percentage of avobenzone was in that product or what percentage of oxybenzone. Spray one might have been different than spray two. They just took different commercial products, different percentages of formulations. The goal was to show absorption. You know, and I think it demonstrated that. Again, we don't know, you know, what the percentages of any of the ingredients were off of this chart. Of course, they are known. But I think it was just demonstrating plasma concentration. Not, you know, again, there's no SPF number here. There's no percentage. There's not a lot of information about what specific. Right. Other than look at the absorption. Here's our concerns. And let's see where this goes. And that's why they did the second study to duplicate it. And again, same thing, no SPFs. It's not about how protective, what, it's just here's absorption of these ingredients. And really this dates back to and why the FDA wanted to do this again, was that these were never really studied in the seventies when they came on the market. The newest one is avobenzone. And I think that was 1999 taking away the Encampsil L'Oreal product, which is from their NDA. So a lot of these ingredients are old, they're small molecules, they're water soluble, they absorb quickly. A lot of the new ingredients are larger molecules and don't. So that's why we hope we can get some of those newer ingredients on the market for the, you know, the public health issue. Mm -hmm. And we had, we have time for one more question. I know there's still questions coming in, so just wanna let everyone know if we don't get your question, we will follow up with you yeah. to make sure you get an answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, will, we will answer everyone's questions. We'll get back to you. And so someone had a question about uh, if you have a patient or client with acne or oily skin, what is the best product or uh, version that you would recommend for them? Okay, can I, can I, and I'll let you do, because she treats patients, I don't, I treat, Employees. employees. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we like to do is we like samples. We like people to try it because even though, and, and I don't know, and I know that's not a good answer, but no matter what you think about it, it's not until you get it home and you try it and you say, yes, I like that. So yeah. we have a few we like. There are studies done, but all those studies were never done on that person. They were done on, you know, paid 
people that go to do studies, volunteers yeah. or paid volunteers. So anyway, you. Yeah. You're... So um, kind of to, to piggyback off that, every product is going to be different for every person. So our products specifically with Taizo, we did test all of them and they are all non-comedogenic. So they're not going to cause a breakout. Now, you know, we do have some that are matte finish that are better for oily skin, um, better for acne prone skin. And then we have other products that, you know, are, are still okay because they're not comedogenic, but they are going to have a glossy finish that you're not going to want to use if you have oily skin. So it kind of all just goes back to checking out the products by feeling them, figuring out what you're going to use them for. Um, but definitely look at the inactives as well to make sure that there's nothing in there, you know, any parabens or any fragrances that are going to bother somebody that might already have sensitive skin or, you know, oily skin and there's a specific product that doesn't work for them. Um, so it just kind of, it goes back to getting different samples, trying different products and just checking out the ingredients and, you know, the form that's best for somebody that would have oily or acneic skin. Terrific. And we've had a number of people asking about how they can get a copy of this to share with some of their colleagues or to review. So I spend so $9.95 to... <laughs> He's kidding. <laughs> Uh, but this Our will be up on metasthetictsmag.com slash webinar and also the Metasthetics YouTube channel by the end of today. So you're welcome to review it and we'll be sending out an email, I think, to all the attendees uh, with the link so you can find that. And I want to thank you all so much for joining us and especially thank you to Amanda and Dr. Fallick. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, folks. Stay well. Yes, everyone stay safe and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, bye.